Um, so this is George from Ireland on my series about the Northern Ireland Troubles and I left off in 1986. The Anglo-Irish Anglo Agreement had been signed. Uh, in Parliament it was the most popular thing that Thatcher ever did. Had no difficulty getting the Labour Party vote for it, to vote for it and the SDP Liberal Alliance. Um, so as I said, the Reverend Paisley was a furious with her, called her that evil woman. So she was astonished with the level of hostility this, um, this generated. So uh, the RUC also came in for grief because they'd had to protect Tom King from uh, loyalist uh, protesters. Not that they wanted to assassinate Tom King. British Gas had an advertisement at the time, come home to real fires. And some loyalists sent this to RUC officers suggesting they might burn them out as RUC officers uh, almost invariably lived in unionist or loyalist areas. Incidentally, working class areas were quite divided by denomination and uh, political outlook, bourgeois areas less so. So it was a curious inversion of the Marxist analysis. In the, the top of the social period, pyramid, um, community relations tend to be quite good, and not just on people's religious denomination, but also their political attitude, whether nationalist or unionist, and could mingle. But uh, the poorer people were, the less educated people were, the more polarised and the more uh, irate they seemed to be with each other. Um, so there were loyalist protesters trying to blockade Maryfield, where the Irish civil servants were. I mentioned uh, George Seawright, um, who was a DUP councillor, and um, uh, he was sent, sent to prison for rioters of fair fray. He refused to pay his fine. He was a member of the Orange Order. Um, by this time, certain um, Orange uh, marches had been banned through districts which were heavily nationalist or republican, and the IUC and the army had to enforce this, so uh, Seawright was always trying to push his way through, um, and um, he said he was the man Sinn Féin fear. That was in one of his uh, election leaflets. Um, then at a meeting of Belfast Library Board, he said the money should be used to incinerate Catholics. Well, this uh, shocked the DUP. Despite the, uh, Paisley saying that the Pope was the Antichrist, they wouldn't have that. He was expelled from the party. He was then involved in a group called the Ulster Protestant Volunteers. Um, it's alleged that Seawright met the IRA and gave them um, low-level information in return for being off their death list. Well, it didn't work. Anyway, he was shot dead um, in 1987 when he was sitting in a car on the Shankill Road. They'd obviously followed him around, had good information on him. It took him about a month to die of his, of his in injury. Anyway, that was that. There's a video about YouTube on YouTube um, uh, glorifying him. So um, anyway, Paisley formed a new group called Ulster Resistance at a, um, a well-known venue, Ulster Hall. It can seat well over 2,000 people. It looks quite small, but then it wastes the space, as modern auditory tend to do. And um, he, he founded a new organization, Ulster Resistance, and they wore their, their red beret, and he had a slogan, Smash in Fane. He posed for a photo with a bat on that said Smash in Fane, and he ceremonially donned the beret. So this is a new paramilitary organisation. It wasn't illegal, but the idea of Ulster resistance was they would only fight if Northern Ireland was forced to join the Irish Republic, uh, and that was that. Now, some members imported illegal weapons and engaged in terrorist activity, at which point Paisley um, uh, severed all his connections with it. But um, others say, well, this is ridiculous, Paisley, you should have known this was going to happen. You've got a private organisation with a uniform. You're talking about fighting if doomsday come, but some of your hotheads are going to do that even before or this happens. Well, it might never happen. Um, anyway, so uh, there was an attempt to sort of have the Anglo-Irish Agreement struck down in the court in the Republic of Ireland. It didn't happen. Uh, Mary Robinson, a uh, barrister in the Irish Republic, she argued that it was unfair to unionists, quite astonishing. Uh, she's a professor of law at Trinity, so she was very ahead of her time, very liberal, saying that divorce should be allowed. And incidentally, that divorce had been defeated in a referendum in the Republic of Ireland uh, at about um, this time. And Fianna Foyle, uh, had voted against the Anglo-Irish Agreement, and I think it was Mary Harney was, was kicked out of the party for voting for it. So um, they felt it was too much of a breach with their Republican traditions. So um, the Sinn Féin party felt scorn towards this and said it's, it's trivial um, and the provisional IRA is the only thing that really counts and we must have a 32 county republic, that's it. But they said insofar as it represents even a tiny step forward for um, nationalism, that's solely because of the IRA. We got, we got them scared. Um, 
Anyway, so devolution wasn't happening. Robert McCartney, a barrister, was a member of the Ulster Unionist Party, and he said we should fully integrate into the UK, well, as we are now, have Labour, Conservatives, and the Liberal SDP Alliance stand in Northern Ireland, and this have mainstream politics. Uh, and that was it, Westminster rule, and get away from pygmy politics, as he called it, and um, sectarian identity. Um, however, um, he was just uh, overlooking the fact that about 40% of people were nationalists, didn't want to be part of the UK system. But uh, McCartney eventually left the um, uh, Ulster Unionist Party, formed the UK Unionist Party. He said he was a real unionist, wanted integration to be a permanent thing. Um, so, uh, let me see. Cardinal O'Fee, who I mentioned earlier, he was the um, Archbishop of Armagh, so the foremost uh, Catholic clergyman in Ireland. And uh, he said he didn't want a confessional state, although he still campaigned for a, a no vote on the divorce referendum. It was carried in Dublin, but defeated in the countryside. So there was a growing urban-rural divide. Um, anyway, so uh, ne next thing. There were attempts to uh, mollify nationalist sentiment. Londonderry is known by its inhabitants mostly as Derry. So Derry City Council voted to change the name of the council to Derry City Council. And the Northern Ireland office accepted that. Chris Patton was the minister who said, yeah, that's fine. Um, but some unionists were incensed by this. Um, there we are. But on maps, it's often called Londonderry. You might notice that uh, the BBC, they usually alternate between Derry and Londonderry in a, in a report, using each one a few times. Um, so uh, the, the provisional Sinn Féin, they can call it that, they decided they would recognise the Republic of Ireland and they would enter Doyle Éireann. Previously they'd refused to do so because it was a partitionist parliament and uh, it was completely unacceptable, it was illegitimate. The IRA's Army Council was the rightful government of Ireland, according to them. But um, this was unacceptable, according to some uh, legitimists in the party. So some real uh, fundamentalists, Rory O'Broader, broke away, formed Republican Sinn Féin. And there was one surviving member of the uh, 1918 Doyle Aaron, Frank Maguire, living in Mayo. And um, he wrote a document that he sort of signed over his authority to Rory O'Broader. So one election in 1918 counted, no election ever since counted, despite their um, absolutist, ultra-nationalist, anglophobic outlook having rejected overwhelmingly time and again. Uh, anyway, it seemed pedantic um, to most people, even within Sinn Féin, to suggest that they couldn't recognise um, the Irish government or they couldn't, they couldn't take seats in Doyle Aaron. So the ultra doctrinaire extremist Republican Sinn Féin, they had their own armed wing, the Continuity IRA, but they didn't manage to kill anyone for a long time. So Sinn Féin's attitude didn't do them any good and they didn't win any seats in Doyle Aaron until 97. So by the mid-1980s, the level of violence was down considerably. Quite a few street riots, and the army and the RUC were quite good at keeping a lid on this without people getting killed for the whole. They used plastic bullets occasionally. But the IRA tried to re-escalate things in 1987. They just reheated some taxes from the 1920s. Um, they had an idea of creating what they called liberated zones, as in there were no RUC stations or army barracks, and from there they could spread their control outwards. Um, so they would attack RUC barracks with big bombs, and this was uh, successful on two occasions. But anyway, in May 1987, they attacked Loch Gaul in County Armagh. Uh, they attacked an RUC station, but the SAS was there waiting for them, and eight heavily armed IRA men were all shot dead. Some nationalists said this was, was murder, so when some heavily armed terrorists open fire in a police station, it must be wrong to try and defend the police officers who are about to be killed. It exposed the um, anglophobic uh, bigotry of many nationalists because the Garda should corner do this. There are times like, say, um, when they've shot dead um, uh, armed robbers uh, without waiting for them to fire first. Uh, and that's, that's Garda policy. Uh, and indeed, one of the um, IRM men was killed, Jim Liner. Take the balaclava off, and he's a Sinn Féin councillor in Monaghan. So the IRA and Sinn Féin obviously overlap very considerably. And the unionists often said Sinn Féin, IRA, they're, they're the same, they're the same organisation two different guises. So uh, anyway, um, the IRA attacked bases abroad because the British Army, the Rhine was quite big then, the British Army was qu had quite a few bases in, in West Germany, not very successful. The IRA plotted to set up a bomb in Gibraltar, which is British territory, a little peninsula beside Spain. The SAS were there said to prevent that happening. And in, on the streets in Gibraltar, three IRA uh, people were shot dead. One of them was a woman. So the SAS said they thought the terrorists were going for guns. Some witnesses dispute that. Turned out three people were killed. 
didn't have guns on them, and they're flown back to Belfast for their funerals at Milltown Cemetery, which is beside the Falls Road. Anyway, Michael Stone, um, a loyalist, launched a lone wolf attack, firing his gun and throwing his um, grenades from quite some distance. But um, the IRA uh, were going to fire volleys over the coffin. It was the army policy not to shoot the IRA, despite them having illegal weapons there, because there was a danger of marks. It might accidentally hit someone in the crowd, or there might be a stampede, people get killed. Anyway, um, Michael Stone killed three people before being arrested by the RUC. He was very fortunate the police got to him for, first because he would have been torn apart by the, by the mob. And it proves yet again that um, unarmed people will attack armed people.